Yes, thank you. So what I'd like to do now is to give a brief overview of what happened last year with this European Citizen Initiative, which I have been uh, highly involved in, in terms of coordinating. And um, so just back in two years ago, we were not too far away from here, when the EU Parliament, it was in April 2012, and it started just like this, with a meeting with basically around 50 people from all across Europe. And uh, you can see some faces here. Maybe you will recognize some of us. Um, so at first, we had about 13 countries, but it's kind of arbitrary figure because some countries were, we, we were in touch with, but didn't really know if they were participating. But approximately 13 countries participated at first. And on the, on the, during the last year, we had much more countries joined. So here you can see on the map the light green countries are the countries who joined the initiative. And, and most inter interestingly, what happened is that in some countries like Greece or Portugal, there, was, there were absolutely no UBI group before. There no, nothing was even talking about it. And in those countries, in Bulgaria as well, uh, groups were formed and uh, started to talk about Basingham and in some cases with a huge success, as, as we will see later on. So I think this is the first key success of this campaign. Uh, that it really created a movement and it created, it created the desire for people to, to take action and not just uh, see what we were doing, but to actually join the movement. Okay, so this is a, the chart of the signatures and also what's been going on in the, in, the pa in the last weeks of the initiative was really, really, really enthusiastic and really encouraging uh, because it just in basically uh, uh, in a few weeks we, we got a very high number of signatures and, uh, and it was really encouraging. Uh, we also had for the first time so many articles in the press. There has, there has never been so many articles in the press about Basingham than right now. And even yesterday, maybe someone brought The Guardian today, there is a piece on Basingham again. So I think we are really this initiative creating something here. And of course, not just because of the European initiative, but also thanks to a worldwide movement and also the Swiss movement, as we will see. And uh, okay, this is just a tribute to our friend here, Plamen Dumitrov, who was uh, from uh, the Bulgarian trade union who, who created a massive support in the very last weeks of the campaign in, in Bulgaria. And this is also, uh, I think it's, it's a quite a uh, um, significant, significant uh, milestone for the movement that uh, a major trade union uh, finally uh, came to support UBI, unconditional basic income. And another interesting thing that we did was to ask uh, the members of the EU Parliament to sign our, our initiative and also to sign a, a statement of support. And interestingly, not only many of them signed, more than we, we thought we could uh, get, but also um, what happened during a meeting in the Parliament in Strasbourg, we realized that some, peop some MEPs, some members of the Parliament, did not know, they, they didn't know each other, but they did not know that they were together in the struggle for basic income. And so that was really interesting that not only we as activists, we could get the support, but we also created something between them. And that I think is also a good sign that something is, is happening and this is initiative, even though we didn't get a million signatures, we created something in, in the minds of some people up there. Um, I won't go too far, uh, but um, as you know, or as you, uh, uh, as you might know, I have been um, um, traveling across Europe um, for this initiative. I've been living as a nomad for one year and, and, and being um, traveling all across Europe has been really inspiring. And uh, maybe two key lessons I, I got from that was that first, it's funny how the objections against Basingham are very different. Uh, in the countries. For instance, in France, people would object basing on because we, are, we already have too much welfare, we, we spend too much money for people who don't even look for a job and blah, blah, blah. And in other countries like Greece, people, or Italy, people would tell us, but we don't even have a welfare state, so I do, how can you imagine a basic income? <laughs> so, so I just wanted to say that this, this funny thing is that there, there are really so many different perspectives on basic income. And that's also a big challenge that uh, in terms of a European constitution to come up with uh, a common framework for Basingham, that, that would be very challenging. And the second thought I, I, I wanted to share with you, um, and again, it's, it was really 
what happened in Greece is that uh, when I went there for one month, I really saw uh, a process of, of mistrust among society, a process of self-destruction. There's, unfortunately, I'm afraid to say that after my trip in Greece, I was totally desperate in terms of, no, Greece cannot uh, survive, cannot uh, recover alone because all the political system is bankrupt. It's, it's totally mistrustful and it's, there's nothing to do anymore. I'm, I'm afraid to say that only a worldwide or European movement can possibly uh, do something to, uh, to help Greece. And that's also uh, something that uh, we should have in mind when it comes to dealing, having this debate about national be basic income first or European or, and so on. This is something we should think about. Thank you. Hello. I'm here to say, uh, to talk about how we in Slovenia are running for European elections as uh, independent basic income lists. We are um, gathering signatures. We need uh, 3,000 signatures uh, to become, um, that we could be, become candidates. Uh, I want to share why we decided to do so. Don't talk so close into the mic. Yeah, okay, thank you. Good. Sorry. Uh, because, of course, at the beginning, uh, in our organization, we thought that it's going to be enough uh, to spread awareness about basic income and uh, that the politicians just have to listen to us and they will change their minds. But uh, actually, we succeeded in that a lot, a big time uh, during our campaign. Uh, so in the last 14 days of our campaign, our ruling party, uh, our prime minister is in it, decided to uh, include basic income in the coalition program. Hmm. Well, we were happy. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's nice. You know, it's nice to become like part of the media spectacle and so on. And um, well, they tried to do that in that way. It was really uh, so uh, ignorant how they came out with this idea, like like they, they don't know anything about basic income, and that's actually true. Uh, and then, of course, we had uh, the new established party in December, and they are so proud that they have basic income in their program, but uh, they, they act like they don't know that we actually have five non-parliament parties uh, already for three years, who had uh, um, basic income in the program. You know, it doesn't help just to have basic income in the program. You just have to have people who genuinely believe that we have to get basic income. Yeah. So uh, that's the problem. And um, if they're just making or uh, putting these badges about basic income on their shoulders, it doesn't help. Uh, and that's why, oh, and there's a second uh, problem. You know, only so-called left parties in Slovenia like uh, are for the basic income. But th that is because the, le the right side of the political specter doesn't know anything about basic income. I don't know why that happened, but they just don't know it. So, because we want to prevent that basic income will become like the play in this polarized um, political sphere, so that uh, uh, it will become like basic income is something what, what uh, left side is uh, having, so the right one is going to be opposed. We don't want that. We want that basic income is like beyond the political parties, and uh, also our idea, our utopian vision is that uh, when we will get basic income in Slovenia, is will going, it's going to be decided on a referendum. And for uh, get basic income on a referendum, we need really, really 
uh, like uh, spread it across all the parties, the, um, the idea for and um, idea for basic income. Okay, well, the problem we have now, we we gathered 9,000 signatures in our campaign, but it was in one year. Now we have one month. The second problem is. Uh, this was virtual campaign on, uh, on uh, the um, electronic signature. In this campaign, we are forbidden or we are not allowed to use electronic means. And our base of people, it's not used to go to this administrative uh, people and just signing and putting that on the post. So uh, it's a kind of problem. Uh, we are skeptical, but you know, all the others, non-parliamentary little groups are in the same, how to say it? Position. <laughs> nice word. Uh, so uh, they're calling us, how much do you have it? Are we going to go together and so on? And uh, also I have to mention, we are extremely uh, valuable because we have a lot of women among us and the others don't. So. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So be, uh, before this um, ECIUB campaign, uh, people in Estonia basically knew nothing about uh, basic income. It was once <coughs> in uh, political agenda of Estonian Green Party during the 2011 parliamentary elections, but it uh, almost went unnoticed uh, there. And there is no major party supports for UBI still, uh, it's true. And no uh, real grassroots movement on NGO uh, pushing uh, for it. So uh, this, uh, but uh, despite of that, uh, when this ECI UBI, uh, uh, we, we joined the campaign, uh, it, it was in uh, November. By that time, about 200 people uh, were, were signing uh, this um, uh, document, and uh, then uh, we we uh, changed this. Uh, uh -huh, now I see. Uh, then then we uh, we. Uh, uh, started uh, me and, and one friend of mine, we started to push uh, for it in uh, internet, in, in Facebook, and then uh, we, we raised significantly the number of signatures. So by percentage, uh, we can say that uh, in, by the end of that, uh, it was the third uh, result in the EU, uh, let's say, uh, by capita. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, there were, yes, a lot of activities what we were uh, doing, uh, so we were translating many uh, uh, materials about basic income because it, this uh, topic was uh, non-existent in, in Estonia so far. Also, we tried to help uh, by, uh, with our modest means the Latvians and Lithuanians to join campaign, uh, uh, <coughs> and I believe that among us today there is uh, one Lithuanian representative. And uh, so, uh, but the challenges, uh, yes, uh, it was that uh, during the campaign, it was uh, really lack of time to dig uh, deeper into that issue that even my, myself, I, I was uh, like struggling to answer all the concerns about uh, basic income. And uh, we, we had uh, big battles in uh, uh, internet, Facebook about um, uh, like uh, com comments about that initiative. Also, there was a lot of labeling going on that most label uh, was used that uh, UBI, it's a certain type of communism that uh, Estonia is having, uh, like uh, being a part of Soviet Union, then uh, uh, that we were accused that would you like to push us uh, back to, to be becoming a communist state or what? Also, there were people who are like saying that, uh, okay, that uh, what, what you are pushing for, it's a kind of uh, new world order agenda that, that you, you would like to us make us uh, dependent more on state and, and, and so on. So it was uh, rather difficult to oppose this uh, criticism, but as, as time went by, we, we grew in our convictions and, and uh, so we were able to adequately respond on those criticism. So as yes, I mentioned end result that uh, what the more than 4,000 signatures uh, were <coughs> uh, 
were collected and also the appearance of the grassroots level movement in Estonia and also I believe in Lithuania, we still have to work a bit about uh, Latvia to, to um, encourage people to also <coughs> take stance on that. And also the appearance of educated debate about UBI in Estonia, I believe that, that now people uh, having uh, more say about that, also people talk uh, more, more about poverty more openly and becoming more demanding on, on government uh, social policy. And then finally that uh, with us today there is a small group of uh, Russian um, uh, scholars and, and students who are representing a, a new youth policy uh, project so I hope that that this uh, message will also spread to uh, Russia and, and hopefully to a CIS country at least it's it would be nice to to have more cooperation in that field so thank you thank you, mm -hmm. thank you very much hello everybody my name is Plamen Dimitrov as I was said uh, I'm the president of the largest student confederation in my country representing almost 70 percent of the labor force in Bulgaria of course, uh, I would like to focus only on five, five issues uh, since we have only five minutes. So, uh, <laughs> first one, actually, I would like to support very much strongly the, some of the, the uh, conclusions and uh, messages made by Guy Standing in the, in the previous uh, um, panel that actually we really would like to, to see this, uh, this battle for, for new, a new life uh, as we would like to live it, uh, not exactly as uh, someone else uh, uh, describe and define before that uh, using the you know, conceptions about the globalization and uh, of course the labor market uh, sorry the, the free market uh, uh, paradigm so the the in, in this in this uh, uh, direction uh, uh, one of the key things that uh, strike us as a trade unionist uh, was the issue about the uh, the notion or kind of uh, uh, issue about the redistributive uh, uh, way and possibility of the working time uh, as one of the concepts uh, that we really need uh, not more labor, more, not more uh, work, but less actually, mm -hmm. but much more proper and uh, just, just is, uh, justifiable, sorry, uh, but just way distributed among, among the people. And this, of course, will uh, allow us to live our life as we would like. So f from this, uh, this perspective, we really are um, being in, in a part of the European uh, uh, Union, uh, we really are thinking about whether uh, basic income uh, network is more appropriate for us or European uh, minimum income uh, to join it because we for a coalition, I said a little bit uh, later on after the, uh, uh, the, the petition uh, um, uh, collection of signature. Mm -hmm. The second issue actually is uh, what exactly at the European level is uh, is doing uh, since I'm a member of this committee, of European uh, Economic and Social Committee, we, we in uh, each premises we are now. So I just wanted to, to point out that there are uh, opinion on this committee, sent it to the Parliament and to the European Commission, which is supporting uh, uh, very much uh, uh, basic, but not basic. It's a guaranteed minimum income. So this is different uh, definition, and of course I'm not going to enter this. Is uh, we don't have enough time, but. The main message is framework directive at the European level on the minimum income uh, uh, in a European country. So, of course, this has to be uh, complementary to the, to the existence, existence uh, uh, level of, of income, pension, and uh, different kind of social uh, benefits that uh, we have. And this is actually bring me to the, to the second, uh, second uh, to, sorry, to the third point. Actually, what we did during the campaign very shortly, it was mentioned already, uh, we we joined very at the late stage of this campaign. Uh, before joining uh, the coalition in Bulgaria, was uh, were actually collected among 3,000 signatures or something. And during the last week, we've got 30,000. Uh, only in one week, uh, campaigning in the uh, union structure, of course, in the internet, but also offline. Uh, it's, uh, I think, it's a good result, but uh, not enough as we see at the European level. We show that. Uh, we really need to, to go further. And uh, the fourth thing that we'd like to, to mention, uh, the possible actions. The pilots that uh, Guy actually mentioned this, uh, this afternoon is one of, the, one of the key issues which we, we are looking for. And of course, you have to be, have to be coordinating uh, approach at the European level. I don't think that uh, any Romanian or Hungarian uh, examples who uh, will, will be alive alone 
but you have to look at the uh, coordinating uh, uh, pilots uh, among us. And uh, we really look for a uh, Bulgarian one, as uh, Bulgaria is uh, the poorest country in the Union, but also uh, the precariat, uh, uh, as Guy uh, introduced in Sofia, in, in, our, in our region and our country is really high, and uh, informal economy is uh, over 30%. So this is a really good, uh, good, good place. Two cities we have selected in northern part of the, of the country and the southern part where is a mixed population, Turkish minority is living, and the northern is the, the poorest region, the whole poorest region, not too, uh, area in the European Union. So I think uh, this is a good, good idea to look for this, uh, this part, but also to look for the nearby countries in the Western Balkans, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, and of course Greece, because uh, we are nearby and of course we can, uh, can do something uh, together. And the last point, uh, sorry, the fourth point uh, is that I mentioned the coalition, sorry, fifth point. The coalition that I mentioned uh, uh, is going to be formed. We are in, uh, actually, we were prepared uh, 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 among us uh, uh, documents that we're going to sign uh, this week, uh, maybe next week. Uh, trade unions, as I said, uh, Union of Economists, which is chaired by Professor Christoph Petkov, which is here. Uh, European uh, uh, Anti-Poverty Network, which is uh, Deputy Vice President is Bulgarian, and of course the Blue Bird Foundation, which was, was the key the key engine uh, being part of this network. So we are really looking for uh, further developments. Uh, we are going to be part of this, uh, as I said, coordinating efforts at the European level and to consider that we have uh, com uh, contributive and non contributive schemes, uh, schemes about uh, social security, social aids, and uh, we have to consider this uh, when we actually look for, for uh, pilots in uh, European countries. Thank you. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, I should talk about the perspectives of Eastern Europe, but I have to admit I don't know really the whole situation of Eastern Europe, so I will just talk about the campaign in Czech Republic, uh, which I know very well in contrast. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, we, we have the idea of universal basic income as a fairly new idea. Uh, the first book about basic income was um, made by two professors, Professor Hrubets and Brabets, four years ago. And there was some academic discussion about basic income, but it didn't spread into the public. It was really just behind, uh, between universities. Uh, last summer we started a campaign for European initiative for basic income and I would say that uh, this thing was the most significant for, for, Czech, uh, for Czech campaign, that the people didn't know anything about basic income. So what we did was not try to convince them to sign it, of course we did this too, but we weren't really able to do that so much because they didn't know about it, so we had to spread the information what is basic income and that it makes sense. I think this applies maybe general to Eastern European countries, as our colleague from Estonia said. Uh, the people had no idea what is universal basic income. And the first thing to do is to convince them that it's not some populistic idea that, yeah, let's give everybody something and we'll all be happy but it's really a realistic concept with huge philosophy behind it, and it makes sense. And this was the hardest part for us to do in the, in the campaign. Uh, I would say there were like two types of people who, who signed, and it was the people who needed it, who didn't really care about the philosophy or the idea behind it, but it was the poor people who, uh, when they heard that they can get some money, they, they agreed to it because they needed the money. And then there was the people who thought about it. But most of the people who thought about this idea rejected it because it was the immediate impression when somebody comes to you and says, this is the idea, you will get some money, you know, everybody will get some money for nothing and we will be all a bit more free than we are now. Uh, the people are skeptical about it. It's also because of the political environment in Czech Republic. And uh, I'm not sure if this applies to all Eastern European countries, but uh, this conservative environment in Czech politics or Czech political environment uh, is, is really, it, it, it really makes you, it really makes the campaign difficult because people don't want, generally the people don't want to experiment and uh, implement new ideas, they just care about, if you look in the Czech media, 
you know, there's usually just discussion about corruption or those practical things in politics, you know, scandals. Uh, but there is no discussion about new ideas or where the democracy should be heading. Uh, I believe it has also a connection with the ex-communist status of our country that we are still my, m far behind uh, Western Europe and uh, people usually care just about ideas that were applied in Germany like 10 years ago and they are working. So they say, okay, well, now we can do it too. If it works in Germany, it's going to be okay in Czech Republic too, you know. It sounds like a joke, but it's 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 real thing. So when you tell them about this new experimental idea they never heard about, uh, they are skeptical about it. So I believe what we have to do is in Eastern Europe is try to tell the people what it is and let them think about it and let them decide for themselves if it's a good idea or not. And there's a paper. Okay, I got one minute left. So. Um, before, before it could be widespread in Eastern Europe, I believe it has to be discussed, and I think that's the breaking point between Eastern and Western Europe, in Germany or in Belgium or in Netherlands. It has been discussed for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, in 28 years, you know. Uh, so now we have to start and uh, uh, do it in a bit of a rush, but I believe it will take some time to, to make the people generally aware of this idea and even more generally to make them aware that democracy is not just about free market and elections, but it's also about thinking where we will head and where our society will head. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, so I will show you some pictures and present you the campaign we've been leading uh, last year in Switzerland. So in Switzerland we have a special thing which is called direct democracy and uh, it al allows people to um, to launch popular initiatives and so if um, we can decide to propose a, new, uh, a law to, to modify the constitution so that was what was done in Switzerland and so it began in 2012 and as you can see on the picture the um, the initiative is on the principle so there is no um, details it the the amount is not mentioned but what uh, is considered important is that uh, the this basic income must allow people to live on, to live on it and to have a dignified life. So here was the the feast. <laughs> and so it was a lot of work in the streets because we couldn't uh, gather signatures online, which was uh, maybe a chance. We were lucky because I, I think that going into the streets is a good thing to meet people and to make basic income more visible because when you work only online you don't really know uh, how much people you touch and uh, how much signatures you will have so uh, we could know how many signatures we had regularly and um, we could change also our um, strategies to collect signatures because at first we thought that online online work would gather a lot of signatures, but it wasn't the case. Um, so you can see what it looks like to be <laughs> in the street when it rains, also with the snow, <laughs> and also in a bubble. <laughs> and uh, so we had some actions really to um, to gather a lot of signatures. So for example, this one was with 100 people engaging themselves to collect 100 signatures so that at one point in, we, ha we know that we have this uh, 10,000 signatures because we had to collect 100. <laughs> Thousand, yes. So the 100 people, they did it. <laughs> the signatures. Yes. Um, yes. This one was another action so that we would collect uh, 30,000 signatures and everyone could uh, take um, a packet. I don't know in English. 
a pack, yes, a pack of signatures. So I could say I will collect uh, 1,000 or only 50, or um, everybody could choose and engage to do that. And so it allowed us to collect a, a lot of signatures. And we were uh, at um, one year after after the launch of the um, of the initiative, we had almost collected all we needed. So. And here was a very special day. We did uh, a challenge day in the whole country. And we this day was 3,000 signatures. <laughs> so I will accelerate a bit. Yes. This is the end. <laughs> when uh, we we had the, the signatures in the council, in the federal council, and uh, maybe some of you have seen this video with the 8 million coins dumped in front of the federal parliament so that uh, it was very good uh, advertisement <laughs> um, and um, it was um, um, I think a very beautiful day <laughs> and uh, um, we can say now that in Switzerland um, we know that we will vote on basic income that's sure we don't know when because now the process is that the the Federal Council is, um, is uh, studying the proposal and then it will say he, he has one year to do that, so till October of this year. And um, then we will know if he advises people to, um, to reject or to accept it. And then the Parliament will also have to pronounce itself. And then that, that will be planned and then we will vote. So maybe in two or three years' time, Swiss citizens will vote. And for us, there is a big challenge. And the, this big challenge is to, to have a very good communication, a mass information, so that, um, so that everyone in Switzerland can hear about basic income. I think it's a real challenge, and maybe it's the challenge of everyone here to touch, uh, to touch basic people <laughs> and uh, to, to to yes to make it possible and uh, yes that's it <laughs> yes i'm going to speak about the context of advanced welfare countries and uh, i assume that a lot of you think that sweden and other nordic countries are but we aren't anymore we are we still are welfare countries but nothing compared to what we used to be and um, i think that's really really sad it's very it started slow we started to sell out welfare start to sell out schools and then it's just gone faster and faster and faster. And um, what we, because we've had the security, we can see we used to have much more equality, especially in Sweden. It's talking about schools, for example, I think it's a really good example on this, that the results used to be about the same all over the country. It didn't matter where you lived, in what kind of areas. But now, since we sold out the school system, the, the changes, it's been enormous. So in the deprived areas, the results is really, really bad. So there you see in, when security goes, equality goes. And Sweden is actually, Sweden and Chile is the countries in the world that sold out the school system most. So it's changed a lot. Uh, we've also sold out uh, the, the welfare system with um, older people care. Uh, and that has made a big effect on people. And I think that's a really good thing with this with basic income, because we can see what we lost and how good it is to have a basic income. So the movement is growing really, really rapidly in Sweden. Uh, from the 80s till about two years ago, not much happened. It was the same people and the same people that wrote books and talked about it. And the only party that was interested was the Green. And then they took it away from their program last year with one vote they lost. So they don't even have it in their program anymore. Uh, but now it's suddenly changing. And uh, we see the big change in the middle class. They are affected by the system now. They work too hard. They uh, lose their job. They get sick. They use the benefits. And they are people that have a voice. So when it reaches this group of people that can talk for themselves, it's coming up on the agenda. So we, we even have something we call the, the middle class revolution. People want to pay more tax. 
they, they go out in the in debates and, and want to do that. We want to have a good system. We want to have a social security for everyone. And I think that's a really good thing. It shows that we are good. Everyone has this good, we are good people and we want to do right. And we want everyone in the country to, to follow this, to be able to have a good life. So I see that as the advantage. You had to go down the whole system before it can start to, to change people so people can speak out. And before, when it was just the people with no voice that got affected, no one really listened to them. But now we, we're trying to get involved, uh, a lot of journalists, so this question is coming out in the media. And even politicians all start to talk about it as well. Uh, and they also start to talk about that we might not have enough jobs for everyone. That's the big thing, unemployment in Sweden as well. We don't have enough jobs. And no one dares to say that. But now it's starting to change. It was an article in one of the leading papers the other day, with an editorial, where they actually said that maybe the government have to, to look at other ways of, uh, instead of just trying to get people into work, that we might not need to work as much as we have done. So. Uh, I feel really positive of the things that are happening in Sweden. It's very different from some of the other stories here. And we have poverty, but not poverty in the same way as in Eastern or, or, or Greece and, and these places. But we're still, we're still losing our security and uh, want it back. So, um, no, I lost it. <laughs> no, I feel very positive and a lot of things are happening. We're trying to do a... Um, a lot of debate, public debates, to spread the message. We haven't done any more initiatives since since the one last year, and uh, we. Uh, uh, but we're trying to educate people because we always get questions, and I think it's important to have answers so we have a good, solid ground to stand on. So that's how we work. The, that's how the movement in in Sweden is is working at the moment. I have only two pictures, perhaps. Uh you can give this first one. I'm speaking about the movement uh, for unconditional basic income as part of a wider social movement, not only in Europe. If you have the, this picture in front of you, uh, I have uh, given three levels. One level is the worldwide level, basic income earth network. Then I have given a continental level and I've called unconditional basic income Europe, and then I have given the national level with the different round tables uh, which was established during the campaign which was described by Stanislas Jordan in the European Citizen Initiative uh, where we have uh, collected signatures for this idea unconditional basic income uh, to uh, check it and so on, how we can do it in uh, Europe, uh, implement and so on. And uh, in this picture, you see uh, certainly uh, the structure of national uh, groups must not be called a round table, as it was uh, called in Austria. It could be in any other kind of platform. But uh, what I want to show with this picture is uh, what we want to achieve. After the end of the European Citizen Initiative, where we had at the end 25 organizers in 25 different member states of the European Union, uh, and uh, this network was built up, it should not be lost. So the idea was uh, that before we perhaps in the future, later, if we get a better European citizen initiative, a more improved one, perhaps beyond 2015, uh, we should not make a waiting situation, but take this network as it was and call it, as an example, Unconditional Basic Income Europe, and take it in a wider perspective worldwide. Yeah? Uh, so that we have national, continental, and for continent, for example, at least at the moment, Europe. It could be another continent also where people come together and make uh, more uh, uh, coordination between these uh, uh, possibilities to make uh, the idea more widespread known in the, uh, public, in the public. So that is, in principle, the idea. What I want, if you give the second uh, picture, is uh, what we have to do, we 
what we have done in Austria. In Austria, we have different groups uh, we, uh, which come together and our self-understanding of this group is everybody who are dealing with the idea unconditional basic income and support these four criteria, universal, uh, personalized and uh, unconditional and high enough uh, to have a, a, a life in dignity. And uh, in addition, that, uh, it is clear that this unconditional basic income does not replace uh, the welfare state which we have at the moment, but make in addition something possible uh, and uh, this criteria in this sentence in, the, in addition is our self-understanding. And uh, these groups which are mentioned, there was seven groups which I've mentioned here, are different organizations from religion side or from uh, other uh, groups from attack and so on and so on, uh, have worked together under this con uh, idea. And what we have not yet achieved is that, for example, trade unions, which we have not yet get in our group. Uh, we have certainly spoken with some of the trade union, uh, but not the highest level. The highest level says, oh, we cannot tell our people such an idea and they think that is uh, perhaps a wrong idea and uh, we are against that we want to have work for everybody and so on. This misunderstanding they have in mind that it should uh, come up by the uh, people under, uh, under her groups. But on the other hand, if you are speaking with a lower level, uh, trade unions, they are saying, oh, we are completely in convinced, so have uh, unconditional basic income for everybody, not only for working people, but we will think about everybody who could be unemployed and they could get support from trade union and so on and so on. But our highest boss are against. So there is a, a um, um, think that uh, somebody is not uh, trusting the other side. But we will work on this to get alliances and to work on this idea. And I hope that if we are going on with a big network in Europe and certainly with the aim to get it worldwide, but starting, for example, going on in Europe uh, is, in our opinion, a good idea. Thank you. Um, my speaking notes are about innovation in politics and in social fields, but I feel the need to explain a little bit about the campaign we ran last year. Um, Romanian Open Society Abroad, being abroad, had not ma uh, many resources to run the campaign in Romania itself, but our main target was Romanian citizens living abroad, which you may already know they um, consist in a considerable numbers in Italy, in Spain, not so many in uh, the northern countries, but we hoped that with this target we will reach our 20, a threshold of 25,000. Unfortunately, we managed just 16% of this, but from this process we learned that the uh, Romanians, most of them take it as a joke. The idea itself seems uh, initially they, they ask you if you joke with them. <laughs> then the main two questions um, arising from our efforts to uh, convince our target group, the questions were how you finance it and why should we work for the poor people to get some money, who, for the lazy people to get uh, the basic income. So the fear of um, working class maintaining the lazy class and the fear of um, utopic ideal uh, um, about some finances that don't actually exist. Um, from our perspective, we did understand the attitudes because the collective mind is set up in a different way than the, the Eastern Europe is uh, collective mind is set up in a completely different way than Western Europe. Um, people are more suspicious about uh, ideals and about proposals for following an ideal and including Romanian diaspora, the um, majority of which is um, um, resulting from economic migration. They, um, 
they present um, their suspicion in terms of fear of being politically manipulated um, for electoral elections and so on. So we're still looking for solutions to get uh, rid of the um, stereotypes from the, our target minds. We're looking for tools. Ideas are brilliant. We, I came prepared today to talk to you about the rules of ethics, who rule, rule uh, ethics to rule the state in the context when the justice is corrupt. So if the justice is corrupt, what, you, what else you have? So you need to invent something else. But I'm not going to talk about that. That will be on paper, probably tomorrow or next week. But from you, who maybe have more tools already available, I, we, we hope to learn and to take these tools and to adapt them for our target group. Because maybe cooperating is, uh, is the easiest way to, to create the tools we need. We need action and results, not necessarily good ideas to remain on paper or online. And I liked earlier today Mr. Hefner talking about democracy. And if I'm not wrong, he said 1986, he started to fight for democracy with a group of amazing people. And is there more democracy in Europe or less since 1986? For my people, I could give you an easy answer, but I'm curious what you think. Is there more or less? Is democracy still alive? Is barely breathing? If it's dead, what we put in place? It, we do need political innovation because we killed God from state. What you put in place? God was, was the aspiration of the mind to perfection. Now it's not there anymore. I agree with that. We, completely like what we put in place. Ethics is an abstraction, is a sleeping abstraction. Do we have instruments for ethics? Can we measure the humankind or the human individual in ethical terms to, to decide if he's the right leader or not to us, to represent our interests? If the leaders are not completely right for us, what is the mechanism to find them? And if we don't need leaders, we need direct democracy, like in Switzerland. If to survive we need to work, then working and having a job and having a job, a place to work should be a human right. If it's not a human right, then we have no object for our obligation. So we should reject that obligation. Therefore, my conclusion is full support for UBI, but in a context full of instruments. <laughs> Less theory, less development of theories, but full of instruments. From a technical point of view, we really need to do a smart work, not necessarily step-by-step step, step implementation, but I wouldn't exclude it. But we need innovative tools, and I'm all for that. Thank you. So my name is Samuel Pulido, exactly. I'm, I'm here to, to talk on behalf of the uh, National uh, Popular uh, Legislative Initiative that is taking place in, in Spain uh, these days. And in fact, it was born the day after the ECI, the, the, the collection of signatures for the ECI uh, ended. This uh, ended on the 14th of January, and the submission to the Spanish Parliament of this uh, National Popular Legislative, uh, legislative Initiative uh, was submitted on the 15th of January. So now it has been admitted in March uh, as a popular national uh, legislative initiative to establish a basic income in, in, in Spain. And there is a period of, for the collection of signature, which is nine months, uh, not including uh, August. So we expect and we are supposed to collect like 500,000 signatures from now, well, from, from March, in fact, until uh, January uh, 2015. It won't be a, a, an easy task. Uh, we are still pending uh, that the, we are given the right to uh, for uh, digital signature for the collection of signatures, and uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, it will be very complicated. We have the experience of the ECI uh, last year. We didn't manage to get the support of big uh, traditional institutions. I'm talking about political parties or uh, traditional trade unions in in the country, but. Uh, the movement and the interest for, for basic income uh, increased uh, significantly during the last uh, year. And in fact, it has something to do with two things. 
First of all, uh, the, well, the, 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 the economic situation in, in Spain that has worsened uh, since the outbreak of the economic crisis and the imposition of uh, austerity measures and structural reform uh, uh, measures. Uh, now we are in a situation where more than 25% of, uh, of the workforce is unemployed, uh, where uh, we have more than 2.3 million uh, unemployed people who lost their job more than two years before, long-term unemployed, more 2.3 uh, million people in Spain. We also have uh, uh, 1.8 million households with no income at all, where their members doesn't receive uh, income at all. So, uh, uh, well, no, no, I'm, I'm going to correct. Where 1.8 million households where nobody has a job, of which 700,000 households where all the members don't receive any kind of income. So these are the correct, uh, the correct figures. So this is the context where uh, this initiative is, is, is taking place, uh, a significant worsening of the economic situation, and also what uh, Guy Standing commented before, and that was very interesting uh, when he spoke about the, the precariat and the political struggle of, of the precariat, because this is the case in Spain. In fact, apart from the academia, uh, the work of people like Daniel Raventos, or I think David Casasa spoke this morning as well. So uh, now this, this five, for, uh, for, for a basic income is being taken by social movements, especially since May 2011 with the movement of Indignados, uh, with the 15 May movement. These um, are many, in fact, there are many initiatives, sometimes, sometimes very fragmented and very local, uh, talking, discussing, or promoting uh, ideas for, for basic income, maybe in Catalonia, then at state level, then in, in another region like Extremadura, which is the, the poorest region in Spain, that, was, that's, that produced a, a hot uh, political debate in Extremadura where this uh, initiative, an initiative for basic income uh, was taken by the parliament, but was uh, watered down in the end. So now we're in a situation where this uh, initiative, uh, legislative initiative is composed of two, uh, two measures. One is the two phases, in fact. First would be the implementation of, of, uh, of basic income for, uh, that would be applicable to a reduced part of the population, more reduced part of the population. So those who are registered in employment services and who are not covered by any income, and also those who receive other incomes about below uh, the basic income threshold proposed in this uh, legislative initiative, which is 645 euro, which is the, the um, correspond to the poverty threshold in the European Union according to Eurostat in 2000, 2011. So in a, then in a second phase, the, it would include the, the establishment of a basic, income, uh, uh, being basic income as an universal right, so applicable to the rest of persons. In principle, is supposed to be residents in, in the country, not just related to the nationality or, or Spanish citizenship. So just to finish, uh, this initiative is born uh, in this by, by the movement, no mass movement against unemployment and job insecurity, initiated last year precisely in the framework of the ECI. They are not limited to the, to the initiative. They are trying to organize, we are trying to organize other actions and, and campaigns. Uh, trying to establish networks with other movements like uh, Popular Solidarity Network, Dignity Encampment, uh, Baladre, Pro-Human Rights Association, or uh, the Youth Movement, Juventus in Futuro, and others. Some political parties, parties have now started to support this initiative, like Equo, Greens Party, uh, Humanist Party, and partially United Left, which is more uh, inclined to the first part of this initiative, but not to the universal component of, of the basic income. So uh, now this in, it remains so only six days uh, to finish a crowdfunding campaign in order to uh, be able to finance the campaign like signature of sheets, pamphlets, delivery expenses, translation, and, and so on. So if you're interested in this crowdfunding, you can contact me or get in touch and I will be speak further about it. So I think this is a good moment. We acknowledge that this is the beginning and uh, uh, that we have many obstacles in front of us, but we really believe that this is really now the moment for basic income Spain.